Hello everyone, welcome to the ninth lecture of the series on the Fiddick Red Book 2017. In today's lecture, we will look at the section 8, which is one of my favorite sections, commencement, delays and suspension. We'll be looking at a total of uh, 13 clauses, eight, clauses 8.1 through to clause 8.13. Uh, I'm not sure whether we will be able to cover all clauses in today's lecture, but let's see how far we get. So let's dive straight in. Clause 8.1 is commencement of works. Feel free to pause our screenshot. This clause basically kicks off the project. We are required to commence the works basically as soon as possible after receiving the letter of acceptance. This time period is either stipulated in the contract but under the fiddy grade book this timeline should be within 42 days of the letter of acceptance if we the contractors do not uh, commence the works in time this will trigger a default and we will be liable so we should make sure that we are prepared and soon after getting the letter of acceptance we should mobilize and start works immediately uh, for instance, we as contractors, we delay to work for whatever reason, maybe our resources are not ready or something internal. We delay the works for two weeks. We will definitely get a delay notification from the engineer stating that there has been a default and this is not good. So long story short, comments the works as soon as possible, but not later than 42 days or any other time period stipulated in your contract agreement. Clause 8.2 is a time for completion. Simple as it gets, this clause states that all the works associated with the project, construction, testing, handover, documentation, all the works within that contract agreement should be completed within the time period specified in the contract agreement. So basically somewhere in your contract agreement, in addition to these general conditions, there will be particular conditions. In those particular conditions, the exact time of completion of the project will be specified. So our contractual obligation is, unless there is a valid reason, we must ensure that we should complete the works in this time frame. If we fail to comply, this might lead to delay damages which we will look at in a couple of minutes in clause 8.7. Like I said, the time for completion does not just mean that you complete the installation or the construction of the works. No, it includes construction, it includes testing, it includes your as built documentation, handover documentation, training, etc, etc. All the works that are part of your exact scope specified in the contractor should be completed within this time frame. Clause 8.3 then is the program. Very, very important clause. It's a detailed clause. So please find some time to go through the whole thing. I will skip and jump straight to the explanation. The explanation is very simple. We as contractors, soon after the project start, we should submit a very, very detailed program of works for approval by the engineer. Typically, this time period is within 28 days from the commencement date. How this program of works is built, whether it is constructed in Primavera P6 or built in Microsoft Project or any other software, this is generally specified elsewhere in the contract agreement. So once this program of works is submitted to the engineer, the engineer has 21 days to accept or reject this program of works. If no such acceptance or rejection comes from the engineer within this time frame, it is deemed that our program of works is accepted and we can proceed with works based on this program of works. After we submit a program of works, if and this is accepted, during the course of the project, if we are required to submit a revised program of works to the uh, engineer, the engineer in this case has only 14 days to accept or reject this revised program. If he does not do so, we will deem that the revised program of works that we submitted is accepted by the engineer. The program of works, as is very obvious, it should be logical. It should show the sequence in which we intend to carry out the works. It should detail the critical path and it should be regularly updated. And these updates should be shared with the engineer. This is normally part of our monthly reports. The engineer may sometimes even hold our uh, payment certificates if the program of works that the engineer has does not reflect the actual status on site and the engineer has asked us to revise this program of works but we have not done so in this case unless a valid program of works exists the engineer can go as far as withholding our payments also a simple example is 
For example, six months into the project, we submit a revised program. But this revised program does not have, for example, the updated critical paths. It does not include the recently updated variations. It does not include many other details. It does not include your uh, resource loading, etc., etc. In this case, the engineer has every right to reject this program and ask you to revise it once again. Clause 8.4 is advance warning. Very, very important clause and should be taken very seriously. But this clause basically states that if we as contractors become aware of an event that is upcoming, that is not common knowledge, and we think that it might impact our progress, we should notify the engineer as soon as we practically can. This applies not just to the progress of works, this also applies to the pricing of the overall project. If we become aware of something that is about to happen that may impact the price of the project, we are also required to notify the engineer in time. Why this is important is this uh, notification allows the engineer and the employer to take the necessary measures to uh, prepare for this event. For example, they need to allocate additional budget. So if this is done in advance, when this event actually occurs, the impact will be minimal because all stakeholders involved, all parties involved will be prepared for this event. For example, we are doing a RCC, we are building a multi-storied building. We are 20 floors in and there's 20 more to go. And suddenly there is news in the market that there is a shortage of rebar expected in the market. We should not wait until the shortage actually happens and we are not able to source the steel. We should notify the engineer and the employer in advance so that maybe they can instruct us to buy steel in bulk right now to source the material for future disruptions. So when this shortage actually happens, we are not impacted because we already have the stock. They can pay us in advance, for example, so that we can proceed with buying this uh, steel in advance. So. You get the idea why this is very very important basically allows all parties and stakeholders to mitigate the risk of future events clause 8.5 is everybody's favorite clause extension of time for completion we will look at the complete details and the procedure of extension of time claims in our later section section 20 specifically but for now we will look at what this particular clause states please read through it if you have the time it's a couple of slides what this clause basically says is that if there are events that are beyond our control as contractors, we are entitled to extension of time. These events can be anything that the employer does. For example, employer is supposed to supply us the drawings. He does not supply these drawings in time. We are entitled to EOT. Engineer's instructions, the engineer issues variations. We are entitled to EOT exceptional weather floods happen there is an incessant rain for 25 days straight force of major happens and earthquake happens wars happen this will entitle us to eot there are delays caused by public authorities once again this is something that is not in our control once again we will be entitled to eot one thing we should note is that for any hopes of getting an eot claim approved we should make it a point that we notify the engineer and all other stakeholders that are required to be notified under the contract agreement within the stipulated time. If we fail to notify the engineer, the entitlement is normally gone. We should also remember that the burden of proof lies on the contractor. Basically, the burden of proof under the construction law lies with the claiming party. Since we are the party raising this claim to the engineer and the employer, we have to prove our case. What I'm trying to say is that this means that our record keeping, our notices of delay, our progress reports, our logs and all other records of the project should be accurate and up to date. This will help our case massively. Like I said, we will look at this in much, much, much more detail in a later section. A simple example is, for example, we contractors submit a claim to the engineer with proper substantiation, proper records, proper documentation, this claim is more than likely to get accepted by the engineer and the employer. Clause 8.6 is delays caused by authorities. Once again, like we spoke about earlier, if there's an event that is not in our control, what can we do as contractors? The same applies for authorities. 
the public authorities they are not in our control we cannot influence them so if they cause us a delay we are entitled to eot once again like we discussed earlier we have to make sure that in order to prove that we have been delayed by authorities we must keep records for example the date of permit approval in writing the date we submitted the permit to the authorities with a stamp with a date this should all be part of our records if we do not have these records it is highly likely our claims will not be successful. For example, you have finished the project and you need the road opening permit now. But this permit is delayed by the municipality. Once again, not something in our control. An EOT in this case, whatever the timeline, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days, is likely to be granted as long as we have documented our submissions and our follow-ups. Clause 8.7 is oh, rate of progress. In my opinion, this is one of the most important clauses of in the FIDIC Red Book. What this clause basically says is that if for whatever reason the engineer realizes that the rate of progress in, is not in line with what is expected at that point in time as far as the program of works goes, the engineer has the right to instruct us to accelerate the works. Now, there are two aspects to it. If the rate of progress is slow because of our defaults as contractors that we have not performed, then we will have to do this acceleration over time, extra shifts, etc., etc., at our own cost. However, if this rate of progress is slow because of reasons beyond our control, in this case, we still have to accelerate as instructed by the engineer. However, we are entitled to costs for this acceleration. We as contractors are required to comply with these instructions from the engineer immediately or we are at a risk of default that is damages and other implications under the FITIC Red Book. A simple example is yeah, we submit a monthly progress report to the client along with the monthly progress report we submitted the updated program of works. The program of works shows a delay of 45 days for example. The engineer realizes this, he will issue an instruction immediately to implement recovery measures and we as contractors are required to comply immediately. The costs are a discussion, yes, but that should not stop us from implementing these measures under the contract. Clause 8.8 .8 is delay damages. This is a clause that no contractor likes, but this clause is inevitable because yeah, it is not just a part of FITIC Red Books. It is normally a clause in every single contract agreement. What this clause states is that we contractors will have to pay pre-agreed amount of delay damages to the employer if we fail to comply with clause 8.2 which was time for completion. The amount of these delay damages is normally specified in the particular conditions of the contract. It can be for example 0.1% for each day the delay happens and will have a cap. It will have a maximum cap. The cap normally is 10% of your whole contract amount. These delay damages will be automatically applied if the time for completion exceeds even by one week. The only way this will not apply is if you have a successful EOT claim in place. Let's take a minute to understand what these delay damages are. Delay damages must not be confused with penalties. Penalties are different and delay damages are different. Penalties are basically punishment. Delay damages are not punishment. Delay damages are a way to make the employer whole. What that means is, for example, you are building a house. You have to hand over the house to the client or the employer who intends to rent this house. If you fail to comply with your obligations and complete this house in the stipulated amount of time, the employer or the client, he loses revenue. It is a loss for him. So these delay damages are a pre-estimate of how much this loss will be for each day and the intent is to make the employer whole. A simple example, yeah, a contractor for example delays the works by a total of 45 days. We do not have a EOT claim in place. Delay damages are likely to be applied and the engineer and the employer have every right under this contract agreement to impose these delay damages. With that being said, I think it's a lot of information for one lecture. Let us take a pause here. I will see you all in the next lecture where we will discuss the remaining five clauses under this section. 
these are very important clauses we'll be looking at suspension and how that works so yeah i will see you then until then happy building